because I'm scared. I'm so happy to be here on this day. It's one of my heroes. I don't know what the hell the dialogic fractionated text is. I don't think it's <laughs> good. Um, let alone a Pekachuka. So I started on the way to 98 Mall anyways. Um, so I, they, I, George asked us, would you please talk to us about what instructional text is? So I offer you my definition. It's about text and readers and something to do with appropriateness and matching these things together until everybody's really happy and no one understands anything. And then I, I started looking at all this stuff and then I realized I was going to follow David Pearson and Freddie Heber who knew more about, who's probably forgotten more about this, so I'm going to do something completely different. <laughs> because I don't really know much about instructional text other than the fact that I couldn't understand the proposal, so the, the, the proposal is at a frustration level to begin with. So I started asking different questions and drinking quite a bit, which led me to this. Why don't we have instructional images? If we're able to level text and do the same thing, what do we do if we start doing this idea with images? Will we have scaffolded images? Will we have different ways of leveling images? Will we start doing this kind of stuff that we've done to written language? Which leads me to the question, what is a 90 to 95 percent accurate reading of an image look like? Yeah. Which would what the instructional text would be. Um, I, I don't know, does it mean you cover one eye to less than 10% so you only see 90% when you're walking around the museum? Um, I, I just don't know what that means in working in the kind of text that I work with. My next fear was we're probably going to end up doing close viewing and there's going to be some sort of rubric that Cliff knows the answer to for finding the main idea of the Mona Lisa. And then we're screwed. So I kind of thought that close viewing wasn't going to be as easily measured, so I wasn't worried about that, so I said, okay, look it. In this shift from written language to multimodal ensemble to image, where image dominates text, there are some things we have to rethink, and we have to do it in a way that helps us reconceptualize some of the things that we work with as teachers and as researchers. And so the first one was rethinking this notion of text, and I'm going to try to do that in a couple slides. Uh, some offerings, some rethinking of analytical perspectives. Um, something that no one's mentioned much of in any of the picture books we talk about, but intermodal associations. And then I wrote a piece a couple of years ago recasting the four resources model in a multimodal environment. And what does that look like? So the text is visual multimodal object, not just as written text. It means we've got to start drawing on things outside of literacy research, such as art and art history and perception studies. Um, Arnheim and Gombrich suddenly become important to read. And how do we make sense of image? What do we perceive? Then the image is always taking place in what I'm calling a semiotic event. There's always someone doing something with a text in a particular place for a particular reason and purpose. And that meaning is beyond the text itself. And we have to consider it in that context. But we also have to um, couch this context of individual things that text is always a socio-cultural artifact as well. And that meanings and humor and everything changes as time changes, as, as readers change, as society changes. And so to look at those things, we have to reconceptualize text as something bigger than a text itself. So this led me to some work I've done on analytical <coughs> perspectives with my new stuff and talking about how do we nest the idea of perception um, and what we notice, like Rabinowitz's work, what do we notice? Within sort of a semiotic frame, how do we make sense of it while keeping all that with inside the nested frame of an ideological perspective? So the notion of intermodal association, we talk about that language and images are different things and they work in different ways, but what really gets interesting is when we start putting image and language together and it doesn't work as we would expect. And Rene Magritte's work, is certainly the treachery of images, does this. It's not just the image. So when a picture book is made and there's an image and a text, it's not two separate systems. There's something in between. And one is concurrence and one is complementarity and the other one is dissonance. So when we have picture books like Brown Bear, Brown Bear and some of the beginning reader books, they have a lot of what we would call intermodal concurrence. We see a picture. And the text is almost like an anchor, it's repetitive, it's redundant. It tells us exactly what we see in the picture in a different way, so it's never exact. But there's a yellow bear with a red basket eating blueberries. And so they support each other very much, and beginning readers do this a lot with beginning text. 
and the New Zealand series did this a lot. But when we get into real picture books, it's more of an enhancement complementarity. You get this image, and it's not funny until I read to you, um, hello, my name is Benji, I'm eight years old, I look a lot like Abe Lincoln. <laughs> now suddenly it's funny, but it wasn't before. And then we move into a third type of thing, which um, uh, association, which is a lot of part of postmodern picture books, where there's something in the text that exactly counterpoints or is contradictory to what's in the image. So in this image, it says here that the wolf huffed and he puffed and blew the house in and ate the pig up, but he didn't even eat the pig up. So if you tell kids, look at the picture and you can't read the words, they're screwed. Because it doesn't say the same thing at all. So as I started moving from text, notion of text, to motion of readers, the first one that had to die was the idea of reader as decoder. It had to be something bigger. And uh, Peter and Alan's work has been very influential, and I sent this stuff to Alan, and he loved what I was doing, so it wasn't like I wasn't trying to denigrate his work. I was trying to build on it. But the reader has now become navigator, and all that that in, in, entails, and not just decoder. And instead of text user, we are now in a more productive 2.0 design that the reader is designer, not just simply user of ready-made text. And so we've got to rethink those things. And then I went to Dublin and saw the Book of Kells, and saw a multimodal text that's really old, and Harmut Stockel said multimodality is basically the late discovery of the very obvious. So I'd like to say that we're now back in the 1600s, and I think I've got a handle on some of this stuff. 